to kind of get settled in here. We'll give a couple of minutes. If you get a chance, uh, go over to the webinar chat and tell me where you're from, where you where you're listening from, or watching, or whatever you're doing tonight. You know, maybe you're doing the laundry, or you're working in the yard. Maybe you're taking care of your cats right now. Let me know if you're in Florida, Arizona, California, New York. Who knows where you are? Idaho. Maybe you're in Hawaii, where they just had the Ironman World Championships this past weekend, which was phenomenal if you're into that sort of thing, as I am. Livonia, Michigan, Ohio, Utah, beautiful state, Detroit, Rock City, Seattle, Texas, Colorado. Got a brother out there, St. Louis, Indiana, Santa Cruz. Wow, that's a tough, that's a tough surf lineup out there, my friends. I have never had the guts to, to roll into steamers up there. Chicago, LA, where they just had CatCon. That's a lot of fun. Va Beach, yes, just up north from me. I'm down here in Ocean Isle Beach. So if you kind of go as the crow flies, we're about six ish hours if we kind of flew up there. But uh I'm down on the East Coast with you, upstate New Yorker, Grand Prix, Texas, Grand Prairie, sorry, North Carolina, that's where I am, New Jersey, man, there is a YouTube channel that my wife and I are addicted to, it's called Boats versus Hallover, and they go to this place, I think it's called Pleasant Point in New Jersey or something, man, that is some insane water, if you guys know about that, let me know in the, in the chat, that's amazing, Jonesboro, Arkansas, Knoxville, Tennessee, well, I'm a good... Georgia Bulldog graduate, so sorry about that, uh, Tennessee. Quebec, I think you guys speak that other language. Mayflower, I don't know if that's the ship or the place. I'm assuming it's the place. If it's the ship, then it's great to have some ghosties here. <laughs> Okano Mountains, Pennsylvania. Germany, oh boy, no spreaking the Deutsch. Sorry, it's going to be all English. Topsail Beach, now this is my people. Thank you, thank you. All the way over in Alaska, never been, really, really want to go to Alaska. Yeah, Davenport, Florida. Hopefully you are okay. Uh, not exactly sure where Davenport is. I don't know if it's further up around the panhandle. Maybe you can tell me in the the uh, chat where Davenport, Florida is. Hopefully you're okay. We, uh, on the coast here, we were just north of the eye at Ocean Isle, so our whole island got flooded out, which is why I missed CatCon, because all the airports on over here got closed down, as you guys probably saw. Long Island, one of my favorite managers that I ever, ever had the fortunate, good fortune of working with. She's passed on now. It's from Long Island. And it's kind of one word from what I understand. Portugal. Portugal. Beautiful, beautiful country. I uh, have fond, fond memories of Lisboa. I have a friend who's uh, living there right now in Lisbon. So it's beautiful. Montana. Gosh, every time I hear Montana these days, I can't help but think about that TV show. So hopefully everybody is watching San Diego, yep, okay, we did get hurt, hit by hurricane, yeah, that's probably top, so, oh no, that's Davenport, I bet, a lot of palm debris, yeah, we lost a lot of trees, I was four miles from CatCon and couldn't go, oh man, that is a bummer, we'll give it just a couple more minutes while I keep uh, reading there, Key Largo, how was Key Largo, I mean, you guys definitely had pushed further north, but uh, you had to have gotten some of the storm surge, I'm just curious, how did it go down there in Key Largo, one of my other favorite places in the world, love the Keys, love diving down there, South Carolina, where in South Carolina, I'd like to know, I'm just up uh, across the border, you know, in, in Ocean Isle, Calabash area, Great state of Michigan. Wow, we've got a lot of people from Michigan. We have a lot of people on our team at Base Paws from Michigan, just interesting enough. Rockland, Northern California. Oh, wow, that's some beautiful. Hickory, yes, best furniture in the, in the world, for sure. I got a daughter up at Boone and the other one's at Chapel Hill, so I think we all know. And Connecticut, that's always a funny word. Well, I tell you what, I think, uh, Casey, if you're good to go, I think we've got a lot of people here already. I mean, hundreds. So thank you so much. And thanks for you know hitting us up. We will be using the chat to sort of for comments and questions and so forth. You know, definitely do that. We're going to reserve time tonight. I'm, I do have some, some information I want to share with you, some important information, just kind of give you an overview. Many of you, if you've followed me over the years, you know a lot of this stuff is similar, but we want to kind of take it, you know, what's the current research and science about obesity in cats tonight. But more importantly, we want to get to your questions. So definitely, if you hear something and you have a, you know, oh, I'd like to know more about that, or how does that apply to my situation, you want to hit us up in the chat. A couple of quick things about that. Obviously, I can't give you a specific 
food brand brand recommendation. People always want me to do that. Obviously, I can't do that for a multitude of reasons. Uh, and if it's a specific medical condition, we may have to punt that also to give you some just general information around that. But I hope you can understand the constraints we have when it comes to practicing medicine over something like Zoom. But again, I want to thank you guys for showing up tonight. So let's let's jump into it. Let's talk about the challenge with chonky cats. And again, this is our, our kitty cat's number one health threat. And we'll show you some of the, the results and, and why tonight is very important because tomorrow is National Pet Obesity Awareness Day, which we'll talk about in just a second. I got to, again, thank uh, you know all of my colleagues at Base Paws and Base Paws Veterinary because you know they are definitely fully on with me on this journey to help uncover some of the genetic aspects of obesity, especially in kitty cats, because uh, that's you know it's an underserved community in general. As and, as a veterinarian, you know, I I used to always we used to always joke, you know, cats aren't small dogs, and you know the physiology is so dramatically different than dogs and humans that you know they really deserve their own areas of, of expertise. So hopefully you guys have great veterinary care, and and if not, you know we can definitely help you out. Uh, obviously I'm on the socials out there, so uh, hit me up. Instagram is kind of where I post a lot of stuff, and you know I'd say it's probably you know 80 percent vet and pet stuff and then of course there's me surfing and paddling and <laughs> running and doing all the other stuff I do so definitely hit, hit me up uh, Twitter Instagram Facebook you name it uh, tonight of course we're going to be talking a lot about pet obesity prevention uh, and if you're in the veterinary community you may want to check out our um, our podcast I mean we're one of the most downloaded in all of veterinary uh, podcasts we get over 25 30 thousand uh, downloads a month it's called the veterinary viewfinder you can listen to it anywhere uh, every week we talk talk about, uh, you know, the, the salient topics, the really hot topics, the tough topics in veterinary medicine. And we've been doing this for six years. So definitely check it out. But this is what I want you to do. This QR code, you can go ahead and get your phones out or take a snapshot or whatever. But this will take you to the 2022 pet owner survey. And of course, what we're asking you are just your opinions about weight management, nutrition, pet food. And we'd like to get your views. And we do compare this with veterinary professionals, because it helps us you know, understand like, you know, okay, what's driving some of these behaviors and how can we help as a veterinary community? Again, if you go to the website, you can see the years of data that we've amassed, but definitely that's the QR code that'll take you straight to the survey. It is live tonight. In fact, we open it up just for you guys because, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to have a lot of people that might be interested in giving us their information. It just takes a few minutes. You can do it on a mobile device, your laptop, whatever, but definitely hit that QR code and, and we'll have it later in the, in the show too as well. Um, why, why are we having this conversation. Why am I so passionate about pet obesity? I'll be honest with you. It's because I'm interested in extending longevity. And this goes back to really my early days in my career. In fact, some of the, the earliest lectures I gave, uh, you know, I, I was, I guess, ahead of the curve when it came to wellness and self-care and stress management and mental health and all that stuff. You know, so 25 years ago, I was giving lectures to vets and I was really talking about ways that they could help, you know, maintain their own health and vitality and energy and, you know, hopefully stay healthy, but also to live a longer, more vital life. And of course, I was really just extending what I was trying to achieve with my pet parent, uh, my pet patient and their parents. And so what I did in 2015 to sort of try to gather like-minded folks around this, and again, if you're interested in this, definitely check out that website, project25.vet. But really, you know, I set out some ambitious goals. Uh, these are some recent articles that I wrote. We are working with uh, baseballs, of course, Project 25 and baseballs. We're looking for cats that are over age 17. So if you have a cat, or if you know somebody who has a cat that we can document uh, with fair certainty that they're over 17, we will send you a free test kit because we want their DNA, because we want to unlock the secrets of their DNA and how did they get to to 17 or 20 or whatever. And we've gotten some remarkable data so far. So again, definitely connect with us at Baseball. Send me an email. I will put you in touch with the people, whatever. However, just if you know a 17-year-old cat, we want their DNA. And again, you're just helping science. Plus, you'll get a free report, of course, for that kitty cat or the person will get a free report. But uh, you know, for us, we're trying to discover what is it that makes that cat unique and how they live so long. But tonight, it's all about chonky cats, right? It's all about those cats that are populating the internet and and you know let's be honest as a person who's an expert in pet obesity <laughs> You know, this is one of those things I'm kind of like cringy a little bit about, but I get it. I understand the sentiment behind the terminology. You know, I think that words do carry a lot of power and impact. And so right now, if, if this is trending and people are okay with it, I'm fine with it. And we'll use it to describe, again, pets that have obesity tonight. And we'll get into more discussions about that. Now, let's take a look at a, a 
common patient of mine, right? And, and every one of you right now, if you're a cat mama or daddy out there, you see a big cat. And I, I've been doing this so long, I can tell you, you know, everybody thinks their cat is like the Shaquille O'Neal of kitties, right? So the fact is they're not. They're probably like me, five foot eight male, you know, 146 pounds. I mean, you know, I'm not Shaquille O'Neal. Now, there are a few cats that do reach that category, that status of superstardom, right? But for most of the kitty cats out there, they are not that massive size. Now, when your vet sees this cat, we've done a good job of, of having them understand and become aware that that is an, a disease called obesity, right? So I think we've done a good job, but, but I don't see them as big or as having obesity. What I see is systemic inflammation. And that's really all the, the areas that I focus on, right? When people say, well, what are you going to do about it? What am I trying to do is reduce systemic inflammation? Because when you look at premature aging, disease risk factors, all of those bad parts of obesity, they're all related to chronic systemic inflammation. And really, when you think about this cat in particular, what's going on, especially with the abdominal fat, right? And we're not talking about that primordial pouch, that, that little tuft of, of fur that hangs down there, right? We're talking about actually fat in the abdomen, okay? When that abdomen is full of fat, it's producing compounds, hormones, chemicals, 24 seven that are damaging every organ system in the body. And so my job and I actually my desire is to reduce that type of excess adiposity is the medical term or excess abdominal fat for sure. So for tonight, when we talk about chonk, the chonk, I'm meaning obesity, and this is a disease. And again, you know, this is Koppelman's original definition of obesity for humans. And again, we've adopted this at the association. We have a global pet obesity uh, statement that we've got 25 of the world's largest vet organizations to sign on. We did this back in 2018. We really worked hard to get a consensus and universal definitions around this. And we did lift this from Koppelman, you know, pretty much straight because Koppelman did, he was the first one to do this back in 2000 for humans, but they define it in human terms. And again, we use a very sim similar terminology in the vet world, a disease in which excess body fat accumulates to the point where health is adversely affected. And this is where, you know, I think a lot of people need to get their head straight on this obesity because people are like, well, my cat's chonky and he's healthy, right? Probably not quite to that disease state yet. The problem is it's going to get to that. It's really just a matter of time. I mean, I, I wish that there were some evidence, any evidence in any mammalian species that has obesity, that they somehow had a protective mechanism that they don't ever see the sequela, the consequences of excess fat tissue, but they don't. And it definitely has significant effects. And we'll talk about that briefly before we get into it. Again, uh, there's a QR code right there. It'll take you straight to the website where you can look at these kind of charts, but these are our charts. And, you know, most organizations have something, but we've settled on some nomenclature, again, getting back to that global pet obesity position statement that we wrote uh, several years ago. But we do a scale of one to nine in whole integers. And again, if you kind of look at it all the way over here, we do too thin, this is unhealthy, and then all the way to cats that have the disease obesity, again, unhealthy as well. And we're kind of trying to target this middle area. And, and the reason, you know, this is a subjective interpretation. These body condition scores, you know, are, are really as good is the observer or the person who's doing the assessment, but they're really valuable because they are giving us an indication of that thing that I've already mentioned that I'm most interested in, and that is the abdominal belly fat, okay? So when I'm looking at these cats and we're starting to make these assessments, we're really focusing in on the areas where fat deposition is most prominent. And so when we see those areas accumulating excess fat, we go to the higher scale and you can, you know, and, and then we say, okay, there's an increased risk. When you match up these kind of studies with, with how we measure, you know, fat like DEXA measuring, okay, which is a, a type of x-ray that measures fat tissues, we find that we're pretty accurate with this stuff. So, you know, again, as crude as it may seem, you know, it's kind of like a BMI, it just gets you in the ballpark, but it's important to start somewhere, right? So the ballpark is actually a good place to be, and then we can start to argue about where's the best place to be in the ballpark. Also, you'll see handouts like this about, you know, and this is the one that's for kitty cats, just general information on what to do if your kitty cat is 
in that seven, eight, nine type of category. Again, that chunk that I'm most worried about and just some simple things. Uh, and we'll talk tonight in more detail about this. So again, when we look at chunky cats, there's a bunch of diseases that they're at great risk for. And, and I wish I could tell you again that your cat won't get it. But if your cat is 13, 14, 15, 16, 22 pounds, it's really not a matter of if they're going to get these conditions, it's when and how many. And that's really same true. This, this is true for dogs, for humans, every mammalian species that we've studied so far. Okay. But again, what are they in cats specifically? You guys know where I'm going to start this already. Diabetes. I mean, this, I'll be honest with you, of all the diseases that I have to sit across from a, a cat owner and tell them that their kitty cat has, this is kind of the one that breaks my heart the most. And people are like, well, what about cancer, Dr. Ward? You know, or what about chronic kidney? I'll, I'll tell you why, because this one is treatable but it's such a challenge to manage these cats, right? And if you've ever had a diabetic cat, you know exactly what I'm referring to. And look, we've gotten a lot better. There've been some amazing advancements with you know, so these, uh, these continuous glucose monitors, that's gonna change the game, but they're still not perfect for cats, right? And just because they like, hey, what's this thing on me? Get it off, right? But regardless, we're making strides, but it's still imperfect and it's a challenge. And so I hate making that diagnosis. And guess what? If your kitty cat is 15, 16, 18 pounds, it's not a matter of if, it's almost a matter of just how much longer do they have before they do it. A lot of GI diseases and a lot of those inflammatory bowel diseases, we're starting to see they're all connected with obesity, of course, fatty liver failure, hepatic lipidosis, high blood pressure, lots and lots of forms of arthritis. I mean, Zoetis just came out with a, a specific drug, the world's first drug for osteoarthritis in cats called Silencia. And why do they do that? You know, do you think, well, gosh, you know, they, why, why now? It's because we're seeing it more frequently. Why are we seeing it more frequently? Obesity. That's why we're talking about this tonight. Many, many forms of cancer are directly related, caused by, I mean, lots of evidence for that. Uh, a lot of eye diseases, including sudden blindness. Again, this is sort of related to hypertension, but we see this in kitty cats. They just go blind in one eye or both eyes, and people are like, what's wrong? And it's like, well, it's 22 pounds. That's what's wrong. A lot of oral disease, skin disease. We've got some tests at base paws looking at oral disease and its links to lots of other problems. And again, urinary tract disorders. So we'll get into all that before, okay? What you want to know and take home from tonight is the fact that if your cat has obesity, every study that's ever been done so far shows that they live a shorter lifespan than those cats that are at an ideal weight. And, and so when we look at it, you know, a lot of people like to talk about these U-shaped curves. They go, oh, wait a second, Dr. Ward, you know, there are these kitty cats out here that they, they're, they were heavier over here and they lived longer. Well, that may be true. Maybe they had some excess energy storage. The problem is, so let's say that you get CKD or chronic kidney disease, you know, at 12 years of age, just arbitrary name, right? Or number, right? So why did you get that? That's the first question I ask. We know that chronic kidney disease is related, caused by, influenced, made worse <laughs> by obesity. So did it cause it? Did it accelerate things? Like, again, I'm going to say what would have happened in that cat if they didn't have obesity to begin with. So again, when you start to look at excess energy storage as protective, okay, I'll give you a little spot of that. And, and we've certainly seen some, some cases in cancers where, you know, but it's like how much is protective and how much is harmful. And when we get into obesity, again, let's, let's stay not just your kitty cat who's a couple of pounds overweight, but the kitty cat that's four, five, six or more pounds overweight that's when it clearly kicks you over into the risk category. So I think you get that. And again, you know, some of the data, the reason that if your vet is not participating in the survey starting tomorrow, you need to say, why not? Because we really desperately need this data and we really need it in cats. We've called it, we've made a strong call to action for vets to say, look, this year we need more cat data than ever before. Why? I am worried about the effects of the pandemic, okay? And there's a lot of reasons why we could say, why am I speculative about this or concerned about this? But I need vets to collect a lot of data this year because we have not had a national survey since 2018. And that breaks my heart to say, we were doing it biannually, 2020 hit, Vets are like, no way. So we we're like, okay, we got to do it this year. And we're really trying to hammer. So again, you can tell your vet, you can reach out to them on social media, say, hey, are you guys participating in that nonprofits you know, study? And they know about it. And uh, if they're not, maybe that'll, that'll nudge them into it. One of the things I want to point out though about the data, and this is our 2018 data. And, and again, since it's the most recent, I'm presenting it tonight, but we've seen this trend clearly established over the last 15 years. And that is that the proportion of cats that 
fall over here in the far right end, the BCS of eight and nine is the growing trend. Like that's the part that we get worried about the most. In fact, when we look at the cats in 2018 that were just overweight, okay, you can see that's about 26%. And we've got about 34% of those that were classified with obesity. And so that's why when I talk about, and, and dogs, as you can see, it's actually fewer dogs have obesity, you know, and more are overweight. And there's a lot of reasons why this physiologically, lifestyle, you know, and all that environmentally and so forth. But I wanna focus on it that when I'm talking about kitty cats, the majority of them aren't just overweight, they have obesity and that's just something. Now, what are the causes? And again, you know, we're gonna to start to hit some, some questions here. I can't see them just yet, but we'll get to them in just a second. And we have a moderator, Casey, who does a wonderful job. She's already going through your questions right now and comments, and she's probably taking some of the ones she thinks that, that maybe you're seeing, we're seeing common trends. So definitely hit them up in the chat because we're gonna be getting to them very soon. But when we look at it, the one thing I want people to take home tonight and, and push back on your vet if they give you this information. It's not just feed less, exercise more. It's not just you're feeding them too much. Now, all of those things are true, but we can't look at it through the lens that says that's the only reason. And a lot of vets still to this day, and a lot of pet parents, maybe some tonight, still think of this as something that is solely within our domain. Well, if you just didn't feed them too much, you know, there'd be no problem. That's just simply not true. And again, not only does the scientific evidence show that's not true, but we can tell you that if this were true, why are the trends in childhood obesity, human obesity, dog and cat and horse obesity continuing to grow? I mean, it's not for lack of awareness. I think if you stop a person on the street anywhere and you say, hey, let me ask you about, you know, obesity, you know, what, what do you think are the causes of it? You know, they're going to go right back to that lifestyle choice. So people know, hey, maybe I'm eating too many, you know, fast food burgers or whatever, right? But they're not, nothing's changing. And so again, you've got to say there's a lot more at play here. Food is part of it. Exercise is part of it. Environment is part of it. But what about genetics and epigenetics, which we'll talk about in just a second. What about old cats versus young cats? That plays a major role as well. What about what food, the types of foods they're being fed? And again, tonight we're not going to get into the raw versus the dry versus the can. I might touch a little bit on it. But, you know, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about the caloric density of foods. Foods today are different than they were 20, 40, 50 years ago, right? And why are they different? They're more appetizing. They're more appealing, okay? So let's face it, there's more calories per gram than there was 50 years ago. And that's just because they're selling food and, you know, I get it, okay? Hormones, biology, a lot of changes there. And one of the things, too, I'll point out are endocrine disruptors. You guys have heard about microplastics like BPA, and that's why you get plastic water bottles that are BPA-free. But there are thousands of these compounds that in very, very tiny, minuscule parts per billions and millions of levels actually alter and affect the hormones in the body. And again, there's a lot of research around this and something that I'm very, very active and very, very interested and concerned about as well. Again, having an obesogenic you know, environment. And for kitty cats, let's face it, they've got kind of four walls and that's it, right? So they get a view, but they don't get to interact with the world. So, you know, if you take a cat that is an apex predator that is used to stalking and hunting prey, you know, and, and expending tremendous amounts of energy in these rapid bursts, right? And then suddenly you go, okay, stay inside all day. That changes everything, okay? Uh, again, other diseases, many medications can affect it, you know, like seizure medications, for example. And of course, the gut microbiome, there's a lot of research that we're involved with at Base Paws and lots of people around the world are looking at that as well. Uh, I do want to kind of point out that we also look at a lot of different kinds of studies. And, and part of why we want you to participate in that survey is because what your, what your answers are to us, that fuels. We then go and talk to researchers all around the globe and say, hey, we're seeing a lot of pet owners say this. We'd like, we think you should investigate this. And so again, the association, our goal is to try to assimilate this information. So again, once again, please take our survey because it does make a difference. And this is part of how we've, we've made a difference for sure. And so when we look at some of John Day's work uh, back in 09, you know, and we, we, we kept saying, look, you know, guys, we think that the pet is actually influencing, you know, how they're being fed, like they're begging, they're pestering, you know, they're, they're 
doing tricks, you know, if they're a dog, right? So that's got to have an influence on whether or not they get an extra goodie or, or the bowl is topped off a little sooner, right? And you know it is. If you've got a cat, you're probably thinking, yep, yep, I, those 2 a.m. wake-ups, that's brutal, man. I'm feeding, the, I'm feeding them all they want just so I can sleep in. So we know that it's not just the pet parent providing food. We know that the pet actually influences that for sure. And, and so, again, John Day and his team, you know, have done several studies uh, that have looked at, okay, what are the things that the cues? And again, not that we necessarily have a fix for it yet. I mean, I've got some tricks that I use, you know, as far as like for kitty cats that get you up at 2 a.m., I try to feed a very high protein treat, if you will. I call it a midnight snack. So let, let's say that you feed them twice a day. I give them three times a day. I divide up the same amount three times a day. And I make sure that that last high protein portion is right before I go to bed. So again, high protein provides more satiety, especially in cats, uh, which are carnivores. And so now I'm trying to say, can I get your metabolism to relax and let me sleep maybe an extra hour? So maybe they don't get you up at two, but they get you up at four. I mean, I'm not going to promise miracles here, but I'll do my best for sure. So there's a lot of ways we do this. Uh, Herring's, you know, research that, that dropped about a decade ago was one of the first studies, was the first study that I'm aware of, that actually showed a positive link between the genetics of cats and the development of obesity. So, I mean, again, this research continues to pile up. Uh, this is uh, out of Cambridge. Uh, you guys probably might have seen this, or I've certainly been talking a lot about this particular study, but basically this was looking at cats and breeds. And, you know, again, there's an extension of this study that looks at specific genomic markers, but in general, the first part of this paper was to say, hey, look, we know that this is appears to be a hereditary. There seems to be a familial influence on obesity in cats, and so let's start to break it down into breeds, and that's what they kind of found out for sure. Um, also, you know, when you look at uh, Corsier's, uh, some of their papers uh, out of, out of uh, UK here, this is an older one, but it, it does, I just want to read it, because we know that life stage and, and what a major diet manufacturer in Europe uh, has brought over one of their foods here to help post spay and neuter. So we know that this is, and this goes back to, to some of, of course, his um, research, but I'll read one of the conclusions from the, um, the paper. Nevertheless, weight management following neutering appears to be very important. And when they say neutering, guys, just so you know, that's spay or neuter. Again, in the U.S., we tend to just say spay or neuter. But when they say following neutering appears to be very important to reduce the overall prevalence of overweight obesity in the population of cats. So, uh, you know, again, when you have your cat spayed or neutered, you reduce their energy requirements by about 30%. So that means if you're feeding them the same amount of food, or if you're feeding them according to the label by law, by regulation, I should say, then you're already feeding them too much because those label requirements are designed for adult intact cats, okay? Not spayed or neutered. So this has to cover all life stages. So it's really interesting. Um, I do want to just point out real quick, uh, Loftus uh, did a, a really interesting paper a few years back where we looked at canine and feline and we looked at um, obesity and we looked at sort of the, the hormones that might be involved. I've mentioned this several times and this does connect back to anything that could disrupt the hormones, medications, environmental pollutants, and so forth. But again, the hormonal stimulus for orexigenic and anorexigenic behavior, this is again, appetite, right? So making you feel hungry or not, right? Um, adipose tissue as an endocrine organ, which we just talked about, and most importantly, clinical management of this. So this paper was a nice overview and really tied together. Hey, look, guys, there's a lot more to this than just people aren't exercising their cats and they're not feeding them, they're feeding them too much. Again, just getting back to the cat behaviors, and, and this draws on day's work and certainly a lot of our work at the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, and we kind of break it into a couple of things. But one, we know that when cats refuse certain foods, you tend to replace it with an either, even higher fat, higher calorie food. You know, we're all guilty of that. It's like, oh my gosh, she doesn't like her favorite anymore. Well, I'll go get this extra, extra special favorite food. And then pretty soon that becomes the normal. And we just keep ramping up until finally what you're putting in that food bowl is so rich in fats and calories. <laughs> you know, it's like, man, if they smell it, they're going to gain weight, right? Uh, begging, again, dogs and cats can influence when and how much just by how they behave around feeding time, right? Or immediately thereafter, because you're looking for cues. Oh my gosh, they must be starving. They ate their food so quickly. Or, you know, they don't like the food because they're sort of just milling around the food bowl and so forth. Again, a lot of interesting things that we look at. And again, we want your opinion, so we could use your help for that too. And again, this whole cascade, we call it the satiety cascade 
complicated, but whether or not a cat owner says, my cat's full, they're content, they like their food, right? That that all of that plays into how much you fill the bowl with. And, and I'll tell you, you know, it's really hard for me sometimes when I've, I'm sitting across from a cat owner and they clearly have a cat with serious obesity. I mean, this is like an 18, 22 pound cat type situation. And, you know, you can tell that they're just, they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to deprive her. Remember that weight loss is never about deprivation or starvation. It's about manipulation of macronutrients. Okay. That's a mouthful. Put it on your, on your, on your gravestone or something, right? But but the reality is, you know, when I look at this manipulation of macronutrients, I'm saying, okay, great. Can we add fibers? Can we add proteins and decrease fats? I mean, what games can I play to make your cat feel just as contented as possible uh, while still reducing the total number of calories, right? And again, still meeting those essential nutrient requirements as well. Well, a lot of people are saying they're going, who cares? They're just chunky cats. I don't want to get back into that list we started off with, but there's lots and lots of scientific literature. I mean, I'm still kind of baffled by cat parents sometimes that say, I don't get it. I've had cats my whole life. They're all fat and they all died happy. And it's like, what did they die of and how old were they? <laughs> you know, because I just told you my goal is to get these cats to, to have an average life expectancy of 25 years. We're nowhere close to that, right? I mean, so again, I think there's a lot of room for improvement here. But again, some of the diseases that you guys should focus on, lower urinary tract disorders. I mean, one of the biggest risk factors for UTIs, problems going to the potty, is going to be obesity. And when I see those kitty cats that are 16, 18 pounds, typically when I start to, and this is a referral case, and I'm looking at their medical history, guess what I'm seeing? UTI, 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 blocked, UTI, you know, right? I mean, so it's like, oh, no wonder this is a real deal. Uh, diabetes, we mentioned, of course, a lot of uh, respiratory breathing disorders, a lot of skin diseases. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't think of skin disease in cats as being a problem, but it, it's a lot of, there's several mechanisms. And one of the simplest is they simply mechanically can't groom certain areas due to obesity interference, right? So there's a mechanical physical, anatomical limitation to what they can groom. The other thing, of course, is going to be how they secrete fats in their sebaceous glands as well. So sometimes they're actually, you know, having to offput some fats. And, you know, again, that's going to wind up in sebum. So that's also an issue for sure. Uh, locomotor disease. So that's just referring to like musculoskeletal diseases for sure, and including spinal injuries. I mean, you know, you, you guys probably hopefully have never had to deal with that, but I have. And these are cats with obesity that blow out their backs, you know, just like those Dotsons and Corgis that do that, you hear about that. Again, this is a study that um, kind of looked at a lot of different factors, but eating predominantly dry food, being a greedy eater, and inactivity were also, again, from owner perceptions, part of the problem. So it's a fascinating, you know, this, again, there's a lot of research. When you ask yourself how much you should feed, you should say, I'm going to do what my vet says. And your vet should be using calculations like I've written in books and, you know, peer reviewed publications over the years, a lot of research, a lot of textbook chapters, you know, that I've authored. And, and we really kind of start to settle around this, this terminology called resting energy requirements. And again, we're just adopting human terminology. And that's something I've been really clear on because the more I can integrate familiarity with like, childhood and human obesity with pet obesity, then, you know, when I'm now working with translational, you know, physiologists or, or pharmacologists, for example, people that are trying to say, how does this one health really work? Well, the closer we are in definition and in standards, then the easier it is to translate. So that's really what we're working on. So again, resting energy requirements. Calculations are different, obviously, but terminology is going to be similar. So people out there that, you know, like I, even when I was, you know, gosh, this is 20 something years ago and I was doing my uh, first personal trainer, uh, certification. You know, we were talking about resting energy requirements long before it was popular and vet. But we kind of do a several different calculations. All this is on the website. But again, you really want to work in concert with your vet before you do this. What I would encourage you, and again, we're going to get to some questions right in just a couple of seconds here. But I would really, especially with cats with obesity, again, not the 13, 14, 15 pound cat, the 16, 18, 22 or more pound cat, is to take a gradual approach to it. I think that sometimes, and, and look, Vets, we, we disagree on this. And even when I'm working on consensus papers with experts from all around the globe or the country, you know, we do have disagreements on the nuances of this. But in my experience, if we just take like, okay, well, your cat's at 22 pounds and it should be at 12 pounds. So the calorie difference is X. Well, let's just go to X. 
those cats, they almost always abandon the diet program because the cat's going into starvation. And let's face it, nobody can stand that because the kitty cat is literally, you know, going to drive you crazy. Right? I mean, yeah, this can get ugly. I've seen some, I've seen some, some bad stuff. You know, I can't unsee a lot of this stuff. And so for me, it's like, I started out early in my career saying, let's do a gradual, let's kind of do this, like this weight loss journey in three month chunks and sort of gradually reduce it. Now, there are some limitations to that approach, but you also help overcome a syndrome that has been exhaustively studied called metabolic adaptation. And that is sometimes if you crash diet too quickly, your body starts to reset some of its thermogenetics, right? So, so thermogenics, sorry. It's it's starting to, to say, okay, I'm going to slow down my metabolism, okay? I'm going to cool my body temperature down. It's going to take some pretty radical steps to conserve energy because you just knocked off 50% of its calories or whatever. And so for me, I've found this more gradual approach helps with the behavioral issues, but also helps sort of slow down or maybe even avoid in many instances, these metabolic adaptations, right? And so I think you should definitely talk to your vet about that for sure. For me, a couple of quick rules for kitty cats. It's a long row and, and I'm going to explain why, but in simplest terms, that's because for most cats, we can only lose safely about a half a pound a month. So if your cat needs to lose six pounds, that's already a year, right? So that's a cat that's maybe 17, 18 pounds. We're already now saying this is going to take us a long time. So I think that we have to be realistic. This is a gradual. I'm not a, there have been cases, you know, when I've had to, to help with like 36 pound cats, we had to take a more aggressive approach to that weight loss because this cat was literally so hypertensive or having arrhythmias, bad things were happening, we're risk of a thrombus, a blood clot breaking off, I mean, bad stuff, right? That we had to be more aggressive, but we were able to do this in a controlled, hospitalized environment. We're typically given a lot of nutrition intravenously. You're not going to do that at home, I hope. And so for us, we want to say, let's make this safe and gradual. And I think that really requires you as a pet owner to realize that this isn't going to happen overnight. And again, even in the human world that I play in of ultra endurance sports, you know, I'm an Ironman coach and all that. That's kind of my jam. And, you know, I think that I, I get frustrated when people just like want to do the marathon, you know, in six months. It's like you can do it, but you're probably going to get injured. You're going to be miserable and you're never going to do it again. And that's I've just seen too many athletes like this. I mean, I'm, I'm be 56 next month and, you know, I still I'm not obviously as at the same level of speed and endurance that I was in my 30s, but, you know, I'm still I'm still in the hunt, so to speak. And, and you know, I, I want you to take this long term approach to your cat's health and say, OK, look, this may take a year. But, you know, what? at the end of that year, I'm going to hopefully extend that cat's life and more importantly, the quality of life for years and years to come. So that's really what I'm looking for, for sure. And again, when you look at the calculations, we're not going to get into it tonight because I want to jump over to some questions. But, uh, you know, again, there's specific calculations that we use. I give vets this. This stuff is on the website. I have published this so many different ways and varieties, you know, and constantly I'm lecturing. I was just out, had a great time uh, out in uh, Texas at Fort Worth at the Southwest Vet Conference. And we did, you know, a couple of uh, sessions on obesity and nutrition and all that stuff. So, I mean, you know, I'm constantly teaching uh, vets. Uh, again, you know, some final tips here before we get into the questions. Number one, if you've got multiple cats, you do need to get in the habit of separate feedings. I do have some rules if you're going to be a client uh, for weight loss, and, my, and that is no communal feedings food bowls, right? This is not an all day buffet, right? You, just, you can't measure the calories accurately. You do encourage overfeeding. You also encourage what I've referred to over the past 20 years as food bowl bullies. So you literally have one cat who has obesity and you have like two cats who are normal weight and people are like, well, those other cats can self-regulate. What's wrong with, you know, Brutus over here? Well, Brutus is the bully. Okay. I mean, you know, he's balling it out at the food bowl every day and everybody else is like, whoa, Brutus, have at it, man. You know, I'll, I'll get what's left over later. So uh, separate individualized foods and you can can time it. I mean, people don't think that cats could ever like, you know, eat all of their food in 15 or 30 minutes. Well, you know, not only have all of my cats been <laughs> raised that way, but I've had legions of clients that have done the same thing. And it, sure, it takes some time. And no, they don't like it at first, but they do adapt and understand that, hey, this is now how we're going to do it. And, and whatever steps you can take to start to monitor the amount of calories you're being, you're feeding them, right? That's, that's really the whole point behind this. Obviously, I like hunter feeders and food puzzles. Automated feeders work great. Obviously, you know, there's some some really good, good products out there now. Uh, a lot of games. You know, one of the things 
I do encourage people to do regardless of their cat's current body condition is to do something called high low feedings. And that is to alternate how you feed and where you feed. Make your cats do some physical activities. If they just eat in the same place all the time, literally they entrain themselves to use the same muscle systems, mus muscle systems, the same type of energy expenditure patterns. And so why not mix it up? So, you know, put it down low one day and on the counter the next or on a chair or table or whatever you can do. Mix it up, move it around. And again, not only is that good physically, but cats are predators. So you're tapping into that inner predator, as I like to say. Again, you need to be playing with your cat at least 10, 15 minutes a day. This can be a feather duster. You know, this can be an automated toy. This can be a ball of paper. You know, <laughs> you've got cats that just love, you know, to ball up paper and throw it around. Whatever you're doing, again, get them moving and active. Finally, about can versus dry. What do I prefer when it comes to weight loss in cats? No doubt I like canned food. Now, why is that? I mean, are you getting, are you in the back pocket? Are you getting a kickback from this? Not at all. <laughs> but why I like canned food is I can control the calories more precisely. When we have done studies, and we've done a lot of these, and one of my co uh, colleagues over in, in the UK, uh, Alex German, this is something we recognized long 20 years ago. And that was the fact that you're so imprecise when you're measuring out the food, right? So we do encourage if you use dry food to weigh it out, use a kitchen scale, weigh it out, find out how much you should feed. It takes like, it takes no more time literally to weigh the food than it does to scoop. So if you are weighing your food, put it in the comments so that Casey can see it and she'll stop bugging me and saying, that's crazy, Dr. Ward, because that's the best way if you're trying to help your cat lose weight. But getting back to canned food, you know pretty accurately, pretty precisely how many calories in that can. It's 180 calories in that can. And so that does give me a little more precision in feeding. Now, obviously, if you decide you're going to give two and a half cans or three cans or whatever, you know, that I've got to, we got to do the math. But we, I can just tell you that in our studies and certainly in my experience, by using canned food, I can more accurately, precisely control the calories and I've had better success with it. All right. That's that QR code. Please take a picture of it right now. It, this literally will take you just a few minutes, two, three minutes tops, depending on how fast you are and how quick you can hit a button. Anonymous, right? I mean, so this is, you know, we just we just want to get your opinions on this. Please share it with your friends. Uh, you know, again, if you have cat lovers out there, we really, we need more cat data. Every time we do these surveys, guys, and I'm talking to you guys, this is just between us, we get so many more responses from the dog people, right? And I need your help reaching the cat community because I think it's so underserved. We don't fully have a good, clear understanding of everything that's involved with kitty cats. And again, unless we can escape this mindset of, well, cats are just like small dogs, then we're just not gonna be able to help you. So again, that's a QR code that'll take you to the link directly to the survey. Actually, you can share that. Again, you can go to petobesityprevention.org and let us know what you think. So I'd like to take questions now, Casey, if you, if you've gotten any, hopefully we've gotten a few of those. I'll leave that up for just a second, I guess, just in case somebody needs to reach me somewhere. Casey, have we got anything? We've got a ton of great questions. And I know a couple of people in the chat did ask, if you didn't scan the QR code, don't worry. Um, after the webinar is over, uh, we'll send out the recording of this and we'll also send you the link just in case you know you miss it or you're not great with QR codes. So don't worry, you'll get an email and you'll be able to click the link and take the survey. Um, but yes, the chat is filled with great questions. Um, I wanted to start with Kendi's question, um, kind of covers a lot of topics we went over, but all in one. Um, Kendi rescued a cat off the streets last December at her spay. She was nine and a half pounds, but now she's close to 20 pounds. Um, they've switched her to diet food, uh, tried getting her to play. She's not super playful. And she's having a really hard time grooming. Um, Kendi yep. feels like they've just failed her, but they're looking for some advice. Uh, what are some good toys? Can we stimulate her cat to play? Um, any advice for this type of situation? Great question, Kendi. And again, you haven't failed because you're reaching out, you're trying to get help. Um, I will tell you, there's a lot going on here, but I think there's one element that we haven't discussed tonight at all, and that's how does obesity make the cat feel? And, and I've written about this a lot. And when we start to look at the, some of the neurochemistry of obesity, and again, we have to draw largely from you know human and, and lab animal studies to, to sort of extrapolate this, but we know that this chronic systemic inflammation associated with obesity makes people feel depressed, even anxious. They, they lose 
lose a lot of motivation and drive and quote unquote low energy levels, right? So I don't think it's unfair to say probably our cats feel the same way. So I think there is an element to chronic inflammation, systemic inflammation and obesity that probably just makes these animals feel lousy right? Because a lot of people complain of the same types of, of feelings, if you will. So I think that's part of it. And this is why, again, when we start to see these cats lose even 10% of their body weight. So like if you can get two pounds off this cat, you may suddenly see a rejuvenation. Like these, these cats suddenly, you know, become alive again. And so I'd encourage you to do that. Now, when it comes to weight loss, it, it, for cats, it's food, it is diet. Because when we look at how they use energy, remember that cats are physiologically completely different than humans and dogs. Humans and dogs, we use primarily fatty acids for our energy sources, right? So fats, and the, they are stored throughout the body, and then we liberate them through the liver, and that's what gives us our energy, right? We use sugar as just for short bursts of speed, or if we you know, haven't been eating or whatever, so like we'll draw on our stores and our skeletal muscle and liver for that glycogen. Well, guess what? Cats almost exclusively use glycogen this type of sugar as their energy source. So this is why I, I was joking, you know, in the slide, but cats don't jog because they don't use that same energy system. They can't sustain that energy. Now, why is this important to you? Well, when it comes to losing weight, we have got to then reduce the calories so that the cat is forced to metabolize fat from stored sources into energy. What kind of energy? Glycogen. So there's this entire different pathway that the cat is having to utilize to lose that excess fat, which is why, again, exercise doesn't help a lot, right? And it really, it doesn't, it's not that meaningful in dogs. And that actually has to do with just a body mass in, problem. You know, their, their, their mass of the, the, the actual skeletal muscles and all that stuff just isn't that much to move the needle. But for kitty cats, they're just not using that same energy source at all. So I would really encourage you to work with your vet. You're going to probably start off at around 80% of your cat's calculated, you know, resting energy requirements. And then you want to do two things. You want to measure it once a month. So take it back to the vet, weigh it yourself, whatever you can do and start to see, am I losing a little bit of weight, right? And if we're not seeing a downward trend within three months, let me tell you what you do. It's very simple. You either reduce the calories. You talk to your vet about this, okay? Because you can't just do this willy-nilly, especially at 20 plus pounds, because then you do risk going into fatty liver failure. And I've seen cats die within 72 hours because their owner just cut the food in half or stopped feeding them as, as much, right? So you, this is not something to play around with. But let's say after three months that the cats only lost a half a pound. I'm going to either reduce by an additional 10% RER, so I never really will go below 70% RER except for in extenuating circumstances, or I'm going to change the macronutrient composition, the formulation of the food. So let's say you were on a high, high protein diet. Well, I might try a high fiber diet, right? And I tell you what, make big swings. Okay, don't like just try a little bit of incremental change because guess what? You don't have that much time. And we've already showed you that they can only lose about a half a pound a month. So it's really three months before we see if anything's working. So make big swings, right? So reduce by another 10%, change from one extreme. Oh, well, let's go high protein to high fiber, high fiber to high protein, low fat, you know, or no fat. I mean, whatever. Yeah, just really swing hard. And a lot of the times I will find getting them off of dry kibble and onto a canned product and we can argue all day long, you know, about why that is, but that does seem to help. And I think mainly satiety and precision, that's, those are really two big drivers for sure. But you can do this. Don't stress too much about the attitude and all of that. You're going to have to do some extra grooming. I can tell you that makes these cats feel better when you can actually groom them. Even if you can take, you know, a, a wet cloth and sort of do some grooming mechanism for them as well, that can make them feel so much better. Because again, I think they're feeling lousy. Hopefully that, I know there's a lot to pack in there, but you know, hopefully that gave you some insight. But you got to work with your vet on this one. That's great. And um, I just want to say that I really love everyone kind of chatting with each other over in the chat and giving each other yes. advice on what's been working for them. That's really great to see. Um, we do have a ton of questions, but I think this is a repeat one. Um, I've seen Leslie, uh, Brianna, what breeds are more prone to obesity? Uh, Leslie has a rag doll that's always been about 20 pounds um, and wants to know if this might be abnormal or okay for that breed. And a similar question about a Maine Coon. 
Okay, so Maine Coons, easy. Shaquille O'Neal, okay? So, you know, those are the largest cat, uh, domestic cat in America. So for us, you know, when I see a Maine Coon, and everybody throws the Maine Coon out, right? But that's Shaquille O'Neal. That's a whole different thing. That's a, that's the Vikings of the cat world. So yeah, you're at it. So, and honestly, I have a hard time, me personally, still to this day, really doing a good body condition score on many Maine Coons because you can be fooled. Those are some muscular cats. Uh, I actually did my uh, clinical internship up in Maine. Maine, in Brunswick, Maine, at Bath Brunswick uh, Specialty Hospital back in the day. And, and that's why I got to see a lot of them up there at that time. And I'll tell you, that's still a challenge. So that's one thing. But then we get to ragdolls and Burmese and Siamese and all that stuff. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's all over the board with these rich breeds. And I've, I've literally, there, there are a couple of papers that come to mind immediately, that, and I'm not going to list them because it's so confusing, where they one particular breed of cat, and it might start with an S, was shown to be more predisposed to obesity in one study and less in another. And so I will say this, I'm looking at genes, right? I'm a genes guy. And so we're looking at things like the MC4R and, you know, and there's a couple other genes in NCL series that we're actually saying, and POMC, of course, you know, because we know that's well established in, in human and canine uh, genetics. So there are certain genes now. So I wouldn't, I, I'm always hesitant to just say the breed thing. I know there's some research out there. You notice I glossed over it, didn't mention any breeds for that exact reason. So sorry to give you an evasive answer there, but that's the truth. What we've got to do is actually look at those genes. Uh, MC4R is definitely a huge target for a lot of us. POMC is definitely one of those. AMI2B is another one. I know that's a bunch of jargony stuff, but what I'm saying is we've identified several targets that do match up uh, very, very well in the literature. And, and that's what we're investigating at Base Boss. Awesome. I think, you know, everyone wants to know about the breeds of their cats. They want to know if that's going to influence their health. And that's exactly what we're studying, right? right. That's, that's what we're, we're on track to do. Um, and, and that's why, that's why you should have your cat's genome sequenced. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, you know, it's a shameless plug, but that's actually, we get to uncover those traits and, you know, and, and again, I, you know, I can't tell you everything that your cat will have, you know, based on its genetics, but we can tell you so much and it does help adapt their lifestyle. So again, getting back to that kitty cat that you saw, like the, these are the kind of cases and we're not quite there today because we, there's some, some research that's going on right now, and I have to leave it at that. But let's say in the very near future, you know, if you do see maybe MC4R, you know, several duplicates on that kitty cat that, you know, Kenda's cat, then that's going to be the cat that we really say, okay, red flags here, we need to make sure we're adjusting the diet. And maybe we do avoid certain formulations, maybe we avoid fats, for example, you know, that's, and, and even starches with the ME2B, you know, sequence or the, the genetic mutation. I mean, that's, these are areas that we, you know, we, we can really take action on. So, Baseballs, this is important stuff. Again, not just breeds. This is more about genetics and the health. Yeah, that's great. And I feel like this question kind of rolls into it. Um, Diana says that her cat Diego obviously has the primordial pouch that we've all seen and touched. Um, her vet says that Diego is probably overweight. He weighs about 13 pounds, but she wants to know if she can kind of tell on her own? Is he overweight? Yeah. Is there anything that me as a cat parent can do at home to kind of test if my cat's overweight? Yeah, great. And again, that's what go to petobestiprevention.org. We've got those charts with descriptions. You can kind of go through it at 13 pounds. You're probably right on the teetering, you know, side of things. That's probably honestly going to be like a BCS of six if I'm looking at it. And I'm assuming it's a domestic short hair. And you're right about the primordial pouch. And let me just clarify a couple of things. I, I hate it when I see this because this is completely wrong and fabricated. That is not a store energy storage pouch right the reason that that flap exists as we understand it is and, and again it's more exaggerated in certain cats or breeds but this is to allow hyperextension of the pelvis so this back leg so when they are sprinting you know these cheetahs are going at 60 miles an hour they are so far extended with their rear limbs that they they have to have extra skin there to allow that upward movement, right? If you didn't do that, you're going to be then limited not only by the abdominal musculature, but by the skin, right? So that's one of those ways that allows those hips to fully extend and rotate 
in ways we can't do. You know, not even the most brilliant gymnast can do what a cheetah or a cat can do. And so that's that's really what that's for. Now, it can be exaggerated. It can be confusing for people. I see a lot of vets that go, they feel like, oh man, that's a bunch of fat down there. And it's just skin, right? So you've got to really push that back, feel up underneath it. And, and I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of cats that that entire pouch is taken up with abdominal fat, right? So it's pushing out. So let's be honest, you know, yeah, there are a lot of cats that it is full of fat, but it's not for storage of energy. It's actually there to help the, the legs do what they should do if they were out there catching, you know, whatever predator or prey they want to catch. So hopefully that answers a little bit. Yeah. And we just don't want to see their little tummy dragging on the ground, right? That's that's well, not going to be a good sign or... Maybe, right? Because it could just be a, an exaggerated primordial pouch, just okay. the skin flap without the accompanying fat. But typically in America, it's got the fat in there. So you know, I'm just I'm I'm trying to be as as uh, as touchy as I can be about this. But hopefully that makes sense, right? So again, just the the flat there doesn't mean they're obese or have obesity. It just means that I need to investigate further, and I'm going to palpate it. And again, if you're looking at your cat from the side and you see it sa sagging down, just go take your hand, and if if you can't easily push up and see that abdominal tuck right? And you, we've got pictures to describe this, but again, it should go gradually up towards the pelvis or the hips. If you can't push that up, then you know, okay, I'm running into fat. Well, that's abdominal adiposity or excess belly fat. And that is the most dangerous fat for us all, right? That without a doubt, that is the most biologically active that is producing the most harmful chemicals and compounds. So that's what I want to avoid at all costs. Great question though. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that little that little tummy test is a is a good way to tell. Yeah. And again, looking down at your cat from above, I mean, you know, again, they should have a waist an indentation. So as the ribs come out and it should come back in with that waist and then flare back out with the pelvis. Again, when I see those blimps, right, you know, that's whenever, again, you say, wow, they're, they're packing a lot around there. That's the upper abdomen for sure. And of course the hips and dogs, that's a, a very common place. But again, this is not brown back fat that people talk about as being good fat, which is more metabolically active for again, body temperature and so forth. This is what, what, uh, animals that hibernate have a lot of brown fat. This is, we don't have that, not dogs, cats, and people are very little bits of it. I want to bring us back to multi-cat households. We've got a lot of questions, you know, they've got yeah. one smaller cat and one, you know, borderline obese cat. Um, some of them have very aggressive, uh, greedy eaters on yeah. their hands. Um, not all of us are home all day. So I think we're looking for some advice on how to keep those cats separate while they eat. If we can't be watching them all the time and really just any advice on how to, you know, keep these cats from being so greedy about food. Right. And let me tell you too, this is one of the reasons why I hate the all day buffet because you do encourage and actually allow food bowl bullying to happen 24 seven, right? So this is why I'm a, if you notice what I say in my, my talks is I say separate timed feedings. And I said, people think you can't teach your cat to eat in 15 or 30 minutes. So really what you should do if you're going to be gone all day is you should have feeding periods in the morning. Every dog owner on the planet does this. I mean, and I'll tell you, there are plenty of dogs that would love to have an all day buffet, right? You know, but the reality is we do need to sort of control those portions. And I think that's a great way to do it. So unless the cat has an underlying, you know, metabolic disorder, a disease, you know, that me means they need to eat all the time, which your cat may try to tell you that they have that disease, but they probably don't unless your vet really says it. But reality is, you know, I want you to go ahead and say, look, you're going to get fed here. And, and for us, you know, in, in our lifestyle, it's going to be feeding in the morning, everybody gets fed kids, of course, kids are now off at college, but you you know, when they were little kids, it's kids, you know, cats and, and dogs, right? So everybody gets fed in the morning, then we all disperse, go our ways. When we come back in the evening, you know, we then do our evening meal. And so I think it's really important now for our cats, we always, in my own personal life, always did the midnight snack. And that wasn't because they were pestering or anything, but I just do believe in that. Like, you know, I like to give that extra protein meal at the end of the day. And there's some reasons physiologically for muscle mass preservation, but that's a whole nother, nother discussion. So for me, if you're asking me about this, and these do sound like food bowl bullies. Really, anytime I see a household, one normal, one not, I say why, right? Because 
physiology wise, maybe, but probably behavior is more influencing that, uh, that situation. So for us, it's going to be, okay, can we then just take that cat and gradually move them to a feeding, you know, a separate timed feeding multiple times a day, three times a day seems to work great for most households or my clients, but I would really encourage you to move in that direction other than just leaving food out all day, which can be a source of conflict for sure. All right. And I feel like we've got a few mixed questions just back to kind of how being ob obese can impact their health. Um, yeah. And before we get to that, just one quick, I mean, there are technological solutions that are slowly maturing. And, and what I'm getting out of these automated feeders that use like RFID tags and things like that to identify when a cat's coming, they open up and allow the cat to eat and so forth. I've really, I hate to say it, but I've still had mixed results. And I've been involved with the development and testing of these things for the past, you know, 10 or more years. And and there's so many different things that we're getting closer, uh, but it's they're just still not quite there. But if you do have a tendency to like to get the latest iPhone or whatever, um, then I would say you should investigate some of these products out there because that might also help you in your, you know, in your journey on getting these cats with multiple cat households. They're, they're just getting close. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, a lot of our audiences seems very, um, very in touch with their cat. They're really confident about advocating for their cat at the vet. You know, if the vet says, Hey, your, your cat's looking a little chunky, they're ready to take those steps to help them lose weight. But it looks like some people are worried about changing their diet, um, if that could have any impact on their long-term health, um, or if you know they're noticing some other health issues that might not seem tied to obesity. Is that still something that they should really you know advocate for their pet on with their vet? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're the only person that could speak to your pet. So don't ever hesitate to use that voice loudly and proudly, right? Because you, you have to speak up for your pet. Um, getting back to changing in diet, you know, I, I get this stuff a lot. And it kind of boils back down to, I believe, you know, this by proxy care, this parenting, if you will. And and we love our cats. And that's, that's why we tend to give them extra everything whenever we can, including love and affection and food. And so, you know, I think we have to start to disconnect and say, okay, let's view the food now for this period of time. And again, I, I think people think of it as a forever change, but it's probably just a period of time change. We really have to focus on it. Treat the food like a medicine because we all know the old saying, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And, and that's really what Hippocrates was talking about is in my interpretation. And so, focus on that and say, okay, you know, look, this has some, some properties and I'm going to lean into that and I'm going to change the diet as I feel is appropriate or as I'm recommended advised by my veterinary professional. And so I, I don't want people to fear changing diet, right? I don't think that, again, it, it in no way am I ever advocating deprivation, depriving a cat of enjoyment of life, or starvation, because again, that kicks in so many other harmful physiological mechanisms, right? So this is this balance. This is why, again, when people just say, well, I'm just going to feed him less, I'm like, that's a disaster waiting to happen, and you're going to fail. So, you know, please don't do that. It's just a waste of time. So I can use the science that we understand to manipulate and, and sort of, you know, nudge the physiology in the direction I want it to go, which is a healthier one. The other thing, too, is people are like, okay, you know, I get it, Ward, but, you know, my cat's happy just the way you are. I'm not going to do anything to upset that apple cart. And, and I get that, and I understand that sentiment. Having said that, it is our responsibility to, I believe, make decisions that enhance and improve and ensure quality of life, right? So if we are knowingly supporting and really enabling some kind of behavior. So let's say your cat wants to eat 24 seven all the time and you do that. I mean, I think again, you have to be willing to accept responsibility for the health sequela, right? And so, you know, I just, when it's a by proxy relationship, again, the cat is not making these decisions. We are making these decisions for them. I kind of say, okay, yeah, you may not like this as much, but you have to do this or, or you're going to die or you're going to suffer. And again, getting back to that Kindy's example of the cat, you know, I, I don't want us to under under emphasize or underappreciate 
the quality of life issues, the emotional well-being, the mental challenges that these cats are probably suffering from. I mean, I, you know, I, I am a firmly a believer in that these are sentient beings. I think they have, have a lot of emotions like we do. Uh, and, and for me, it's like they, they must be miserable and just frustrated. I can't do the things that I love to do once. And so I'm going to try to do everything in my power to enable that. So I know that's a big way around uh, the soapboxy kind of thing, but I, I really want us to not fear making these changes when they actually have been proven and shown to make tremendous impact. And again, not just in adding years, but in adding quality of life for many years. I mean, this is like a twofer. And so, you know, when people are like, well, I'd rather be happy for a shorter amount of time. It's like, but what if they could be happy for a longer period of time? You know, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Great. And I know we're, you know, we're almost out of time here. We have a ton of questions. Um, just so everyone knows, don't worry if we don't get to your questions. Um, we're going to be sending out the resources that Dr. Ward talked about earlier. He's got so much great information on his website. I am pretty sure you'll find the answer. Um, but I do want to give you this one last question. It's one of my favorites. Um, we've got an anonymous attendee wrote this in. Um, their cat likes to sing the song of their people in the wee hours of the morning. And they're, they're begging for food um, is what this person is thinking. Yep. I know that we've all experienced it probably, um, but what are a couple of little tricks we can, we can give this person to stop the, uh, the songs yeah. that night. I, and I love that metaphor. I, I love that. You know, again, this pestering behavior waking me up at 2 a.m. So the first thing we've already mentioned, the midnight snack, a high protein, highly concentrated, and this can even be just a protein source, right? This can be a, a, a filet of a piece of salmon or tuna or something like that, right? Really highly protonaceous snack right before you go to bed. Okay. The, uh, so that is trying to buy you time. So I'm satiety, you know, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I, I sleep till, or I don't pester you till 4 a.m. The other thing that people don't over, they, they overlook, and a lot of vets forget to mention this, but I've had a lot of success is resetting the feeding timing, right? So remember, we go back to separate timed feedings. What I've found is that instead of feeding first thing in the morning sometimes, or by adding an additional one, you know, throughout that period of 24 hours, so we divide it up into four times. Again, I'm, I'm typically, I am biased towards protein, high protein foods for cats. So that's that's just, you know, again, based on my understanding of the literature and the physiology, you know, I'm always going to be advocating for high protein unless it's just wholly unsuccessful. So now I'm going to try to say, can I make more frequent feedings or can I readjust by an hour or two to try to, again, get you a window of time for sleeping? But finally, I will say this is part of living with a predator because remember, those behaviors are instinctively tuned in to feed when it is dark okay so dusk and dawn that's when they're most active so when you look at a cat predation you start to go what are the two hours before and up until after uh, sunset and sunrise so now you got this kind of four hour window either time of day when we are actually our body temperature is lowest time you know i mean we're in our typically have one more cycle of deep sleep or certainly REM sleep right before these hours and so we're in our most restful restorative stage of sleeps and cats are like Let's party. It's time to go, guys. So again, that is part of living with a feel a day for sure. Yeah, we signed up for it, but uh, you know, I, I I found that most cats you can start to adjust, and you can make you can re reach some kind of truce with this song of the night. <laughs> I love that. Um, I will say that I have been using the midnight snack trick, and it has been working yeah. very well for me in this household for a very food motivated lady. Yep. So. And we've talked about that with you, Casey. And again, you know, Casey's just taking some simple advice and you start to tweak it and make it your own and you'll find it really does kind of nudge it. And, you know, people are like, well, they still wake me up early, but it's like, did they get you an extra hour or two? I mean, that might be all the difference in the world, but you know, hey, or you could just do what I do. And that is get up at 530 every morning. That works great. <laughs> exactly. Either or we can take our pick, but <laughs> maybe that... I got up, maybe I started getting up at 530 because of my cats and not just to go train. Maybe, maybe, maybe the whole journey began back with Pelly Cat back in the day. You never know. <laughs> you never know. I think my cat keeps me on a schedule. I think she, uh, she knows the day better than I do. So 
I think we and just the seasons. I mean, the yeah. seasonality right now, guys. Your cats. We've just you know passed into the you know the solstice, and and th this is what they're in tune with. Their hormones, their physiology right now is changing in ways that ours is not. So I mean, you know, again, they these guys have insight and they're in tune with nature in ways we aren't. And again, it affects their behavior, their feeding patterns, their sleep, awake patterns. I mean, all that stuff. And guess what? You're about to come into a period when your kitty cat is going to be more somnolent, right? They're going to going to have a longer period of rest. So maybe that'll help as well. <laughs> I hope that it will. And um, I know some people in the chat are still asking. Yes, you guys will get a recording of this whole webinar. Um, we'll send out an email to the email address you registered with. Um, so you'll get the recording. You'll get all the resources we talked about today. Um, definitely hoping that some of those will give you more insight into what's going on with your cat. Um, and we'd love for you to take that survey. So Dr. Ward, if there's any, uh, you know, closing statements you'd like to make, um, we're so happy that everyone could join us tonight. Uh, any chance we get to talk about chonky cats. We That's right. And there's just so much more to it. I mean, you know, we need to come back if you're interested in more in the genetics of there's so much more that we're discovering at Base Paws about the genetics and their health impacts. And more importantly, you know, I'm only interested in looking for genomic markers that we can take action on, right? There's a whole lot of genetics that we really can't do much about, but there's a lot that we can. And so, you know, those are conversations that we really look forward to having with you guys. So if you're interested in that too, tell Casey in the chat or send an email or whatever, because uh, again, we'd like to have more of those kind of conversations like this, maybe a little more researchy from time to time, but also loaded with some practical advice. So if that hits your, that's that's your jam, let us know for sure in case you will make it happen. Yeah, that's the QR love, code. <laughs> we would definitely love to have Dr. Ward back to talk about longevity. I know we saw a lot of kitty cats in the comments that did make it to 17 years or older. Um, so if you're interested, we will have Dr. Ward back. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here and taking the time to chat with us and we will talk to you soon.